Thanks everyone for joining us. My name is Rob Straw. I'm the CEO of Seeps Zurich Campus in Horgan here on the lake. Welcome to today's uh, Lessons for Leaders webinar. We started this series of Lessons for Leaders webinars last year as a uh, response to the pandemic breaking out. We never expected this to take so long as you didn't either. Um, and we found it was a great way to connect uh, to, with, with you, with our alumni, with business executives, uh, with people who are interested in Friends of Seeps, to connect it to this network. And it was a great way to explore new topics or topics that have been somewhat or largely impacted by the pandemic in particular. And due to popular demand, we've seen some great responses about uh, starting this series again. And we've decided to continue it initially virtually and then hopefully potentially live and virtually going forward in the future. So if there are any topics that you would be interested in hearing more about and us exploring together with our professors and, and experts um, in our network, please let me know or let Hannah know. Today's webinar is on the topic of M&A amidst a pandemic, sit still or make a move, question mark. So as we look, uh, in fact, I sent out a, a, a overview from Reuters the other day to the speakers on uh, global M&A uh, track record for the five months, for, uh, sorry, for the four months beginning of the year. Wow, fantastic, fantastic things happening. Um, is that because of the pandemic? Is it as a reaction or is it just because business has picked up? What industries? We've got a lot of questions, uh, probably more questions than answers today, um, but it's a great topic. And our two speakers, and we have an experience share, we'll explore today with you of how the pandemic has changed the M&A industry, what's happened, where we are today, what are the opportunities for the and, and future uh, would look like. In fact, when we were having a, a pre-meeting the other day, I, and I asked uh, both Professor Say and Teo particularly to give recommendations. Again, recommendations, uh, no, no responsibility for what your actions may be on recommendations, but we know that you love to hear our, our, our tips and our recommendations for the way forward. We welcome you to ask questions via the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get through some of these uh, at the end. Of uh, So we're going to have two, two speakers present, and then uh, I'm going to ask uh, an alumni to give his first impressions and reactions to the speakers. Before, we, uh, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to conduct a very short poll to get a flavor of your mindset this morning, this afternoon, this evening. In the current climate, when it comes to an acquisition, would you sit still or make a move? So just initial reactions here about where you are with M&A. You see any results? Wow, okay, make a move. Uh, 77 to 23%, that's, that's pretty great. Okay, that's very clear information for our speakers. Second question. Do you think the pandemic has had a positive or a negative effect on the M&A industry? Not possible. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Because that's not what um, the Reuters data uh, or any of these, uh, you know, uh, global news firms that are tracking, tracking the M&A right now would say. Um, I'm not going to go into the answers of this. But positive 28, negative 16, 56% of you said not possible to tell you. Great. So that, let's bring up these topics uh, when we're speaking in the, in the next few minutes. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Professor Se Young Lee, she's a lecturer at SEEPS. She's a lecturer of strategy. Her current research uh, primarily concentrates on the strategies of technology ventures. Some of her working papers and expert papers focus on revealing how technology ventures mobilize resources through interactions with key resource providers, such as venture capitalists and, uh, and strategic acquirers. So she's really an expert in this space. Professor Say, thanks for coming. Uh, Teo Staub, Staub is uh, 
a graduate of, of our former institution. He's the CEO of Provident, Proventavia and former CEO of Jet Aviation in the United States. He accompanies firms in the aviation industry in particular in their M&A process, as well as restructuring. I'm sure he's got quite some stories in the last 12 months, as we know the aviation industry was heavily hit. And he also teaches crisis management. So it seems to fit crisis management and aviation in the last 12 months. So Teo, also welcome to you. Um, I hand the, uh, the uh, presentation and the mic over to Professor Say. Uh, thank you, Robert, for such a kind introduction. Let me share my screen. I have some slides that I wanna share with you. Um, first of all, I'd like to really thank you for having me for this wonderful opportunity. Um, hi, hold on. So as uh, Robert mentioned, m and is a topic that I'm very passionate about. So it's a, uh, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts. And my goals are actually really simply to sh sort of set the tone for our discussion. So more importantly, um, I'm interested in our, our discussion that's going to take place later on, especially with Teo's input and your questions. So um, looking forward uh, to, to your responses and discussion. So, so first of all, um, let's take a quick look at what's been going on. Um, so. Uh, if you look at the chart on the left um, and consider last year, um, earlier in the pandemic, there was a significant drop in the number of M&A activity. And some companies were probably finalizing whatever was um, existing um, in, in their deal um, process, but not really doing much more than that. But um, since the third quarter and since the later um, end of last year to this year, so M&A deals were not only coming back, but seemed to be at a really high flow. And so um, as you can see on the right, um, especially there has been a high interest in the tech sector and um, we'll be talking a little bit about why that is um, later on, but mainly two things that are going on. Um, one is there's a lot of activity and a lot of interest in tech companies. So for example, in Asia, uh, tech companies doubled to 136 billion um, US dollars last year. And in the US, um, and of course this is in the same, along the lines of tech-based companies, a lot of venture capital backed um, companies um, went M&A. And so it hit a record high at 75 billion US dollars. And um, not only the final um, acquisitions, but there's been a lot of CBC deals as well last year in the year. Also another record high at $72 billion. And so there are probably a few different things um, that are enabling this surge in activity. And probably one of the things is that a lot of buyers are actually in good shape. And this is probably because a lot of capital markets have been favorable. And with that, um, so for example, this is a sort of the CEO sentiments. Um, so this was based on a survey of uh, 167 CEOs um, earlier in March this year. And what they've been saying is that um, a lot of them, almost three quarters of them are saying that they fully recovered from the pandemic and or will do so by this, by this year's end. And also the vast majority of them are also saying that they have plans for capital investment this year. And so this will be a continuing trend um, contributing to the high level of M&A activity. And I should also note that not a lot of companies are sort of faring this environment the same way. And it's likely the case that there are many companies that sort of became um, attractive and available targets over the last year because of the pandemic. And so another contributing factor to the trend is probably has to do with the availability of targets. But what I think um, is interesting and more um, important right now is that at this point over the past year, there's been a lot of sense making of what has happened and um, a lot of uncertainty has resolved and a lot of businesses are adapting. And this includes um, M&As. And so a lot of companies doing M&As are also adapting and starting to find sort of, sort of new ways to go about this process. And so here in this article, um, as you can see in the headlines, um, we realize that we can do due diligence virtually. And this is probably not something that many would have imagined pre previously. And 
a lot of uh, businesses are getting increasingly comfortable and um, confident with these kinds of ideas. And so again, the, the situation um, it is, is not, it's becoming quite favorable for m &A activity with these, um, with these sense making in mind. And so given that the situation is there for them, um, there are some specific motivations for m as this time around that I wanted to share. And this is sort of um, where I wanted to leave our um, discussion. And one thing seems to be that many companies are realizing that they need to go digital. So um, they need to change, they need to reposition some of their activities differently. And this is pushing towards m and And so they're, they're thinking, oh, um, let me, let's add specific products or tech that could change our processes and we can go digital, accommodate digital work and, and so on and so on. And there's really good reasoning to that because um, m and as we know, is a, considerably faster way to get the things that you would need or um, get your foothold in, in a space that where you need to be in specific markets. And one thing to note about that is that there's going to be a lot of competition among companies with similar motivations. And this on top of the already higher valuations that we're likely to see based on this heightened activity and the surge of activity will definitely um, have an influence on how attractive uh, that m and will be for you as you consider um, maybe achieving the same goals or same strategic objectives through other forms of partnerships, other forms of internal initiatives and so on. And another observation that I wanted to note and share with you is that a lot of um, m and as mentioned is happening in light of um, the, the availability of targets. And um, this is, um, as mentioned, undoubtedly due to sort of uh, sort of the availability of um, based on these struggles that came along with the pandemic. So companies they, uh, companies, they seem to be thinking that they could take advantage of the, of the opportunity and sort of um, to, to move ahead. And my thoughts are that the, um, considerations of the underlying objective should be the same as usual. So again, um, m and is a very good way to quickly get the resources you need to get to the market that you need to get to. And sometimes a um, very good way to, to harness the innovative power of young companies and um, maybe especially in high tech vector sectors where a lot of the companies have been um, that's where how, that that's where they've been getting um, these innovative resources um, that's needed for established companies. And of course there are, um, and maybe other reasonings as well, like uh, adding new products that could help you save costs here and then adding new tech and so on. And what I'm trying to say is um, as long as the companies are pretty clear about these objectives, um, I think there are really good opportunities, but at the same time, um, they need to be in general, considerably more careful about acquiring in sort of um, places that they're not really familiar with. And I also think companies should be aware that um, even if they're quite experienced and established um, in these uh, M&A type of activities, um, because of the pandemic, there are um, clearly some constraints on activities that are really known to be key to the success of these M&As. Um, like relationship building or due diligence or innovation. And despite the innovative um, efforts that have been made, um, this is, there's still a huge constraint on these activities. And the reality is um, you may not be able to move forward with these activities in the same way you, that's, that's, that you've been doing um, because of the environment. Okay. And so with that, um, I give the floor to Theo and look forward to our discussion. Theo, I'm just gonna hand it right over to you to, uh, to present and, and give your thoughts and insights about this. Robert, also from my side, I would like to thank you for the, for the introduction and uh, thank your organization having me here for this uh, webinar where we can share some experience in the M&A field. 
Promontavia, we are in the merger and acquisition field. Uh, we are a boutique based here in Switzerland. We represent either the buy side or the sales side. <clears throat> we also sometimes have the privilege to being into, uh, involved in an acquisition where we have to show the board or the CEO why they shouldn't do the acquisition. So that's also a very interesting role. We are involved in turnaround situation of companies, uh, restructuring, mainly in the industry, aerospace and uh, production industry. That's our domain. We do that worldwide. We're heavily involved in Europe, Far East and uh, the US. That's the, the short introduction about uh, Proventavia. Right now, I would like to share some of the general observation in the field of merger and acquisition. Uh, the activities are really accelerating. Now, the indication uh, are there uh, that we have uh, more and more activities in that field. That has the effect that valuation actually of potential targets are increasing, continue to increase. Uh, that's just a fact because the demand for acquisition targets is pretty high. There is also a huge amount of capital in the marketplace which needs uh, new place, new homes. Uh, this one you can also see with the latest trend where you see all these SPACs, especially in the US, special purposition, uh, special purpose acquisition uh, vehicles which have been introduced <clears throat> actually a while ago, but uh, really uh, the popularity increased dramatically during the COVID time. Now is this hot market in m and companies are advised actually to pay attention uh, about the valuation and not just be in the race to win the game, uh, to win the acquisition. Uh, they have to make still the classic analysis why an acquisition makes sense for the company. So they have to pay attention to the fundamentals of a potential acquisition. So many indications in the marketplace show the direction that within the next 12 months, uh, merger and acquisition activities will increase. The interest rate remains on a very record low. Uh, record low. So refinancing of, a, of an acquisition uh, from an interest, point, or interest rate point of view uh, is interesting. Uh, the risk assessment, the leverage amounts are not as aggressive than it used to be in the past. It's still a kind of 50-50 as a uh, rule of sums uh, that you have to bring 50% equity or maybe 50% you can leverage. Uh, based on the COVID, uh, some companies or industry, and Rob mentioned at the beginning, aerospace is one of the industry which is going to a downturn. Uh, there will, after the phase where we have government aid for the different companies, uh, there might be a situation that you have distressed assets in, in the marketplace, which is an opportunity for consolidation, uh, an opportunity for acquisition. So since we still have the governmental aid in the marketplace in Europe and, and in the US, uh, the distressed assets will come on the marketplace once this uh, help has stopped. Then what was actually triggering COVID-19 in this area? Uh, as Professor Say actually said in the introduction, what company learned during that process is really using technology to uh, actually use part of the M&A process in a digital version, like due diligence, uh, virtual data rooms are now commonly used uh, in most, most of the transaction. So people could have seen the advantage of uh, digitization, the acceleration of digitization has actually 
increase during the COVID-19 time in merger and acquisition. Also management presentation, where in the past, everybody wants to see the management presentation physically. Management presentation takes all, take all the praise, place via Zoom meetings, other, other electronic platforms. So the valuation of asset remains high. It's still a big challenge. But however, uh, even in these new times, uh, the mistakes are still the same. The same which are made in M&A. Uh, people saying the M&A transaction is done once the, the contract is signed and the target is paid. So still not enough attention is actually uh, brought to the post-merger acquisition to all these uh, processes. What one can see is a slight shift maybe in the interest from a geographical point of view, uh, whereas uh, prior to the pandemic uh, situation, COVID-19 situation, the M&A focus was very heavily on Far East. Now we see a certain shift or a certain attractiveness of market like uh, the US and uh, Central America and especially also Brazil. So there you see a kind of a geographical shift. Uh, if it's sustainable or not, uh, we don't know. <clears throat> so regarding the areas uh, of interest, the industries, uh, TMT is still very hot, MedTech is very hot, financial services uh, are very hot. That's a kind of an overall picture. Now, since I'm working in aerospace, I will give you a kind of uh, insight there. Uh, there will be a consolidation in the MRO business, maybe a consolidation in the airline business, which, you know, they're going through uh, dramatic times. So in the classical industry, there is potential for consolidation. At the other hand, there is a, a great hype uh, in new technology, uh, especially in the eVTO market, where these new ventures are very well financed now via the vehicle of the SPACs. So these, I call it PowerPoint companies, uh, are very highly valued and they've been able to raise money via the SPAC, just to na name a few like Archer, Joby, Whisks, Lilium, Volocopter, uh, and uh, others. Obviously, it's clear none, not, of, not all of them will be successful in the marketplace, but some they will really change the aerospace industry uh, towards a more clean industry, uh, using other technology, using electrical power for short haul, uh, using alternative uh, energy for uh, the middle range and uh, the long range uh, aircraft, the technology there regarding fuel is basically sustainable aviation fuel. That are the big words in that industry. So this new technology on the energy side, this new technology regarding eVTO brings a lot of new opportunity also to invest in future technology in aerospace. So that's my introduction to uh, this topic right now. And I think I hand over to Rob for the next sequence. Thanks, Theo. That's great. Um, I, we often um, ask a expert speaker to, and there's often an alumni, to listen and observe and give their inputs on the other speakers. So we've asked today Bernhard Jung, He's an MBA alumni back from 2009. Hi, Bernhardt. Thanks for joining us. Um, he's uh, he's uh, responsible for strategy and for M&A Asia at the Uptar Group. That says a lot. Um, so he's responsible for the Uptar Group's presence in the Asia Pacific region via and via a combination of acquisitions and joint ventures and partnerships, as well as business model transformation. So 
Bernhard, maybe you could share two or three of your thoughts and, uh, and reactions to what Professor Say and Theo have, have shared today. Uh, for sure. I mean, uh, thank you, Rob, for coordinating and then thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, I think a lot of what like uh, Professor Lee and Theo definitely mentioned, um, you know, I definitely agree with a lot of the points they made. So, I mean, I'm not going to repeat, I think, a lot about uh, what they repeated, but rather how can I add a bit more of like mm -hmm. um, sort of the reality on the ground as a practitioner in this field? I mean, you mentioned several themes that Professor Lee mentioned as well as Theo, you know, like a lot of the themes pre-COVID did exist, be it from a macroeconomic or behavioral or structural mm -hmm. perspective, but these were probably, you can say many of these were also accelerated because of COVID. You know, if you look at macroeconomic, widening between rich and poor, maybe also aging population because people were not having kids. You know, behavioral as well, you'd say changing habits in a sustainable supply chain, just because in the past it's all based on economic profit um, maximization. So rather than having localization in which you can have supply chain stability, how do you shift it in a way that um, you're not bounded by the profit motive as much? And there was also a lot about smaller, flexible companies that were also coming up. You know, you saw that when the larger companies were not able to provide as so, you saw the entrepreneurial companies, be from India perspective or China perspective, I think the facial mask was a great example. They came out to fill the void. And then when these came on, then and then there was not as much demand. They shifted to other sectors that you know, we reached the void, you know, the, the rising of the small flexible economies. And then you also had the topic of digital production and digital where it's working just because now working home, you know, you can do a lot of the work from home. So how do you do that? So I think it's really about how do I take that to the next phase of how that's affected as a strategic investor, as a multinational across three separate businesses, because we serve the pharma perspective, you know, a lot of the drug delivery devices. We also serve the beauty in home market, be it fragrances, skincare solutions, personal care, all the pumps that go along with that. F&B perspective from closures, bottles to ketchups, and also a services component. So how has those kind of um, affected our logic of making M&A? So I'm going to focus a bit more from a um, normal acquisition perspective, as well as from a venture strategic investor perspective. I mean, if we go back to, I think, I think all the logic of how you make M&A it's very much the psychological journey. I think that's something that Professor Lee mentioned to feel comfortable. Because in the past, you can see a lot of mergers and acquisitions, you know, even if you have a local m &A team, the person who makes the decision would maybe be sitting in Zurich or Chicago, New York, London, you name it. So it was more of a reporting function um, for the ones who are a bit early in the organization. But then for the companies a bit longer, then you can have a lot more local empowerment. And I think in a lot of the companies which didn't have as much of that local empowerment, it definitely accelerated that as such. You had to make it work. You have to empower the local teams, believe they have the ability to do it. And that also resulted in how the local empowerment, how can you actually change your business models um, and serve the new niches and markets and leverage their insights so that you are not um, disaggregated by the loss of communication when it flows through headphones. And that was a very big change, I think, in the organization. Because mm -hmm. um, ultimately, we all know how to incentivize the local team, given the dynamics of making decisions overnight, because the competitive dynamics, you know, the key person criteria may have shifted. And also, the way we make decisions, they have shifted. So the way to look at it from a strategy perspective, which may have worked from the local team and filtered to the um, headquarters, now we have probably three other pillars that are now probably more focused on now. Like how do we think about organization to complement the strategy? Because if you don't get the right organization, given the disaggregation of supply chains or need to satisfy key person criteria, that's going to struggle. The operational side, because you know that on the consumer front, we may be struggling with the business models, which may be face-to-face -face interaction. So how are you going to reconfigure your operations in a way using M&A that it not only looks good on paper, but you're going to have a very clear logical flow that from the bottoms up ties in with the strategy. And ultimately that comes down to people. And if ultimately we 
may not initially feel comfortable, the dating mindset, I think, has definitely changed. Because before, it was almost like, okay, we want to, so as an M&A person, you can say, okay, we have to do this acquisition. And then a typical m and process in the past was you finish a deal and then you pass it on to your business unit. But that has totally changed now. Sure. I mean, we've taken a lot of experience from Chinese organizations who've actually been very good at integrating businesses in China. I won't talk about what happened overseas, but at least in the context of China. And it's very good in making sure that the technical capabilities of the startup itself is leveraged back to the organization, which ultimately is a line of incentives. So it's the same the case of us. When I do a deal, I don't, I, I don't, I can't just rub my hands clean. I mean, I have, I have my short-term incentives tied in now from a medium and five-year perspective, just to make sure that if you time for long term, would you be recommending that deal at that valuation if it was your skin on the game? Likewise, as a venture, I mean, sure you have a framework, but we ourselves now coming to a point mm-hmm. where part of our business, uh, part of our bonus as well as our money is tied into that as well. So, if we are going through the process, but how do I add on the additional level of certainty for headquarters that my interest as an MA person is also aligned with the company and the business? And I think that's probably the one of the bigger differences, I think, pre-COVID. So, so let me let me let me point out something that, that you just uh, mentioned indirectly. This uh, conundrum between profit and purpose. So M&A historically has always been about improving the profits. <laughs> it's buying a market, it's buying a product, it's buying a geography. It's, it's you know, um, it's almost always been about profit. Uh, I, I looked on, on the participant list. Uh, I've been teaching M&A and, and finance for 25 years. Um, uh, that's, that hasn't changed ever. Just now, we're also looking at m a for purpose and because purpose became more and more relevant during uh during the, the the covid are we are we seeing any trends towards firms buying for purpose it's a it's a almost a philosophical question yeah because we're seeing that again um we we, we had this pre-talk with professor say and uh and teo that the pmi stuff the integration Firms are still awful at this. I mean, awful. So you might have a few mm. sprinklings of firms that do this pretty good. It's great. Your firm is um, is also, you know, it, tying you into the incentives and making mm. sure that there's a blend. But overall, we're seeing this purpose uh, integration is is um, is still a challenge. And then Professor Say mentioned this virtual due diligence. So. You know, it used to be about the people. It used to be, and Teo mentioned it, it used to be about the, the management presentation was most important. Mm. Now, I don't have to go there. I don't even have to meet the, the lady running the company and owning the company. Mm. I don't need to, I don't even, we can do all this virtually. Mm, are we, how does all this fit? Teo, what do you think? Well, meeting the CEO of a target company is still important because you have to make the decision you want to keep in or you want to fire them. Yep. So mo- mo- most of the time in a, in a transaction, uh, the previous CEO is no part of the, the future of the, of the company. Uh, very often because uh, there are succession planning in a company and so on, it's a, it's a natural uh, transition. But the, at the other end, meeting the key people, developing the trust, and at the end of the day, it's a mutual trust, a trust issue, uh, is still a kind of a, a very important factor. If the team fits together or it does not fit together. That's not about good or bad. I mean, one person can fit in this corporate culture, the other person can fit in the other culture. It's, it's, it's like a football team. Mm, mm. If, if you're not playing the top league and you have a player from the top league in, in, in the second tier league, uh, you might cause a problem in your, in, in, in your team because the, the person might be too good, too special, whatsoever. He does not fit in the team. To evaluate this criteria, I think the personal contact is still very important. But a lot of things where everybody saw in the past, uh, we have to travel there, we have to see it. A lot of things which are more rational 
they can be done now with uh, new uh, electronic uh, means. And coming back to your statement, you know, in the past, acquisition have been done just for profit optimization. Uh, clearly, we still see that. But new opportunity coming on the marketplace, not driven by economical reason, by driven by other society demand, like all the technology for CO2 reduction, mm -hmm. which, for instance, reflect in aerospace that these new technology are considered. Uh, <laughs> that are new ventures which are purpose-driven. Obviously, to invest in this purpose-driven company, I mean, people want to make money. Sure. So it's more about new opportunities come in the marketplace because of all the demands and purposes of the of the society. Thanks, Professor. So I think what are you another thinking? point I could. Oh, go ahead, Bernhard. Go ahead. Because so, I think another point is also to add. Or I mean, um, you know, profit and sustainability are not mutually exclusive. Because I think, um, you know, when our experience is that, you know, when the pre previous job at DSM as well as right here, right. Some of the trends now are so strong. If you were to look at those details in sufficient, um, from a execution perspective, what you actually realize is that the business models, if you can get it to kind of shift because you see the logical flow from start to finish, yeah. it is not mutually exclusive. I mean, even when it's, I mean, take so use the case of DSM, right? We, also fit, we had a very clear business model back then where you take the case of electric vehicles as well as um, normal combustion engines. Our model was that like we, the materials we are going to thrive in, it is um, trend agnostic when it comes to vehicles. If you were to have a digital an electric future or a combustion future, they're still going to use the materials we provide. It was same as well from a plant-based protein perspective or from a dairy perspective, you still use some of our ingredients. So I think if you get that correct, then um, purpose and profits can actually be linked into one. Professor, I what think, do you think about that? I'm, I'm, I, I want to make a comment here. Uh, purpose and profits are two dimensions of the strategy. The, the most important one is the time frame you're looking at the strategy. Uh, you, you buy a company with the idea you're going to have sustainable growth or whatever forever. You want to keep this company? Or you buy a company, you want to do short-term optimization of your profit. Mm. You want to optimize it within the, the optimization of the profit within the next 12 months. Basically, you do asset stripping, taking apart, sell it off, and so on. Uh, or you say, okay, we want to optimize the profit of this uh, production R&D company over the next five years and say, okay, we're not investing in new R&D projects. We commercialize on the technology we have, and uh, after five years, uh, we have a new situation. So with every strategy, not only in M and A, you have to define the time frame you want to look at, uh, at this project. So for private equity, normally uh, an acquisition is a project. Mm. They're going in, do something, going out. Yeah. Five to seven years, traditionally. Now you have a new concept in m and from certain private equity company. They call it evergreen investment. They say, okay, their strategy is buy and hold and live off the dividend, not off the exit. Yeah. So the, in every strategy consideration, uh, that's also the mistake which is always made. And I would like to, to hear the, the opinion of Professor Lee is that you define first the time frame over which you want to develop the strategy. I've been looking at this primarily on the selling side instead of the buying side in terms of research. And so I've been talking to a lot of founders in terms of how they go about um, choosing the right kind of partner for them. And I wanted to share that mostly it has nothing to do with what is rational. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's usually about a lot of um, relationship building and Teo mentioned trust and that that has been found to be the key. And a lot of that has to do with um, how much interaction you've got and what kind of conversations you've had. And I'm actually really curious to see because 
they're doing do um, they're doing all these things electronically, but the outcome of that hasn't really come out yet. So um, it's really a, a something for us to wait and see if that really works out for them in terms of um, integration and and how the partnership actually um, stands on the on the um, in the long term. And um, let me think a little bit about what Teo said about um, long term versus short term. Um, so, what were your thoughts um, in in terms of um, what was the question around? Is it in the perspective of the buying firm? Like, what does that mean? Or is it a changing landscape because of it? No, the question was actually, uh, when it comes to strategy, M&A strategy or any other strategy discussion, the most important thing that you first define the time frame you want to look at this target, this problem, this strategy, before you start the discussion. Uh, you want to develop a strategy for a company uh, for the next two years, for the next five years. Uh, Where are you going with it? Yeah. Yeah. So that's so, very, very important. And very often that's got forgotten. One person has the opinion, I look it forever. And the other person say, hey, I'm interested in what it brings the next 12 months. Yeah. And you never find a consensus if you do not agree prior to the discussion. Look, we're looking at that problem next five years. Are we interested to bring this acquisition? I want to know what this acquisition brings to the company till I'm retired as a CEO. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and not a lot of people are honest about that either, right? So they don't really bring that conversation onto the table. So they don't really share their plans with the people that they're going to buy. So there's a lot of misalignment there in terms of um, um, what they're looking for. But um, in terms of the, I mean, there's all kinds of motivations, right? It's not just the time frame. Um, some some companies buy because they want to be bought, you know, because they can show that they they can buy. So I, I don't think it's just it's just about the time frame. It's about the very specific thing that you're looking for in terms of an acquisition. And I agree with you though that they should be looking um, if they're um, looking for something strategic in mind, then they, they should be thinking very hard about the time horizon and if the you're going to be able to get the um, get the acquire party sort of in line with that to, to get their commitments towards that. That's going to be the difficult part because not a lot of people will be, will be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, I'm going to go to some of the questions that are coming in. We've got all these questions from the audience. Um, uh, let me, let me go to one here. It's from Gian, Gianluca. Gianluca says uh, VC backed businesses constitute 20% of the U S GDP. And you're, and, as your data shows that this trend continues, maybe even globally. Are there any measurements concerning M&A activity post COVID that give an indication about the quality of an M&A in terms of their contribution to human progress, meaning sustainability and social equity? Are we seeing any things here in the last 12 months of contr contribution towards human progress around sustainability and social equality, other than lip speak. Everybody claims it. Are they really doing it? That's again about the real motivations, I think, uh, yeah. Well, I haven't, I haven't seen any statistics about that, but with these social trends, uh, one thing can be said that certain industries are neglected by investors, especially PE investors, mm -hmm. where they say, okay, we cannot, uh, invest in that because we promised to our our shareholder or, or lender or whatever that we're not doing that like you know uh, investing in uh, alcohol production I just mentioned something or investing in, in defense uh, or investing into nuclear power right. that are almost banned industry from an investor point of view you find almost non-private equity companies or investment funds that wants to invest in this type of industry. Yeah. At the other hand, this forgotten and socially not so accepted industry are uh, showing tremendous opportunity right now because they still exist. Sure. Uh, we're still drinking alcohol and somebody has to produce it and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I Robert just Hart used like... Um... Yeah, Bernhard, go ahead. No, because I, I think I also like, you know, because I think for every trend that goes, you can always have a counter argument, right? So, mm. you know, if even if like there's some people who are kind of saying that, okay, there's a lot of greenwashing, there's a lot of this sort of talk, 
Um, but at least, you know, it's always like, when does it get to a tipping point where it becomes real talk yeah. rather than just greenwashing talk? I mean, so what we're also seeing is that because of that trend coming in and then more people with you no know, activists, investors, et cetera, are trying to get people to do actual work that proves that they're not greenwashing, at least you are do having MNCs as well as investors who are walking the walk. Mm -hmm. And how they're kind of doing that is like, you obviously have, for example, if you're talking about venture invest, uh, venture capital funds, that you do having specialist firms come up. You know, if I use like the circular economy in Singapore, there's a pretty um, successful one right now called Circular Capital, started by Rob Kaplan. And how he kind of incentivizes his period ago is like the people who invest, we know like the Dow Chemicals, Unilever, L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, we've had these kind of targets. They also set, um, the fund also sets lower hurdle rates rather than your typical 20% IRR. They actually set 8% IRR um, just to make sure, knowing full well that like the starting phase to actually getting the acceleration of the whole mm -hmm. market takes time. So, and, and then up gradually, because you have such a good backing by multinational and well-known MNCs, then you do are seeing more copycats. So, I mean, ultimately, I think it's just which part of the cycle we are at. I and mean, we are at the very early stage of the cycle, despite having how many years of media attention and financial times write up, et cetera. So I think, you know, we will get there. It's a stage of like, when do you get to when this really starts to really accelerate? Mm. Okay, thanks. Let me come back to another question from the audience. John says, uh, thanks for setting up the great topic on the, on the virtual due diligence, and this has been going on for a long time now, but uh, I understand due diligence has been already been done virtually more and more before COVID. Is there an observation on if there were any additional virtual elements or practices during COVID than before? Did we see a spike up here? Of course, we just couldn't visit, right? We I mean, what, one thing that we have done is that we have added uh, some other dimensions because, you know, Teo made it very clear, Professor Lee also made it very clear that at the end of the day, businesses are about people. So, mm. you know, when you miss that human connection, there's always something that's lost in connection, like meeting someone virtually versus physically is always um, very different, right? So some of the things we've also made, put in place on top as another due diligence is really how do we access the psychological mindset for a partnership mindset at the top level, but also at the middle level, which is really what really drives culture. So if we look at a startup, for example, if we're not able to invest, uh, if we're not even physically in person, we've actually started to have other so-called psychological profiles. And these are different from your typical MBTI and stuff. Like it could be almost like what really drives you as a team? Because it's all about the team that actually, what's a highly effective team? So maybe at the very beginning of a startup, which is very different to the drivers innately in a team when you're in a mature organization. So we basically use like, you know, very simple eight metrics, that learning, you know, um, having fun, having results, stability, order. These are some of the dimensions that already have a very um, robust, but yet simple set of um, questions. And then we actually lay it out you know, their team as well as our team. So we were able to work together. How did these dimensions play? So even if the tool has flaws because nothing is perfect, but at least how do we increase the likelihood that it could work when we have a physical impediment in not being able to work at this point in time, but there is a market and corporate need for this technology or for this channel, whatever you're acquiring the business for. Mm. Yeah. So that's been a big focus. We had a call. Some of my team had a call just just before this with uh, ABB. For us. Yeah. ABB is a huge, big tech company innovating, and they're coming up with some very interesting ideas around mixed reality. And I was thinking mm -hmm. about our our you know how, about the due diligence stuff and wondering what how could we use the mixed reality to actually not just do this two-dimensional, but actually be in the space with those senior and middle management could be a very exciting potential way to, to actually do this virtual due diligence in an entirely different way. Um, on that, let me go back to a, to a question from the audience from Robert. This is uh, for Professor Lee. You mentioned that there you talk to a lot of founders and the reasons to sell are often emotional. 
what which reason to sell do you hear the most often? So I, I think there's a little bit of a difference between deciding whether you're selling or versus who you're selling to. And I think I was talking a little bit more about who you sell it to, because whether you sell is more is a bit more strategic. It, it has to do with the specific kinds of hurdles that you face that you feel is difficult to overcome and the kinds of opportunities that come by with the right kind of buyer, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to who you sell it to, I <laughs> there were founders who would sell to a person because he was the person who came knocking on the door like the most number of times yeah. so so yeah those those would be the kinds of reason your familiarity you've had this really good conversation um you feel like you belong there you like them for whatever reasons would, would surprisingly be um mattering more to you than um, the number or the valuation that they give you mm -hmm. <laughs> especially if they're not that far off so yeah those are my thoughts so it's not always about the money as we go back to the profit and purpose. It's about, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we, again, it's, it's one of these things where most, especially in the startup space for selling it and exiting, the women and men who do this, do this for the idea, to live the idea, to live that dream, and yeah, hopefully make some money, but that's secondary to the purpose. So when they're selling it, there's very often that I want you to carry it on and build it bigger and better than I ever could. And not yeah. necessarily about the cash involved that I get. I'm yeah. very close and to someone right now who just cashed in on a very small deal. But if, you, if, if you're 32 years old and you have $17 million all of a sudden in your bank account, you can decide what you're going to do for the next 20 years. You don't have to go to the job market. It's it's a game changer. It's not 170 billion or anything. It only needs to be 17 million to change your life, right? Uh, if I gave yeah. you all 17 million, it would change the next, how you think about things, right? So we get into this yeah. behavioral thing and back to pro profit and purpose pretty quickly, right? And you'd be surprised how many founders are actually really looking forward to continue on with their company inside the parent company, but that sort of gets not very aligned with what the company wants sometimes because they they, they wouldn't want the founder um, doing that. And so you'd be surprised. A lot of founders um, try to get deals out of uh, for themselves, for them to continue on. Mm. So here's a question from Rohit. Vertical integration as strategic partnerships and JVs versus M&A. That's a, not a question, just kind of a topic. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I guess it really goes down to the definition of M&A, right? Because, um, yeah. you know, acquisitions, you know, you can, I mean, lots of times, you know, if we, it goes back to the thing is, what do you bring to the table? What do they bring to the table? How do you structure in such a way where it becomes win-win? but mm -hmm. also respects your red lines. So, I mean, when we do vertical integration, the first consideration always is, what are the key purchasing criteria of our customers and the consumers? Because if we're not able to satisfy that, then I think, um, you know, then there's no point in considering this topic altogether. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just, I use like, you know, our B&H business, because like, in the, historically it's been a component business, but in the case of China, and that was very successful in the European market as well as the US market, but in the case of China, regardless whether you are the small independent brands or the big companies, the competitive environment is such where all the local brands are rising a lot quicker. So even your L'Oreal's and Estee Lauder must change accordingly. So that means that you cannot just be a component supply, you have to be fast um, and have full service solutions, et cetera, et cetera. And if we're not able to do it throughout bureaucracy, then you kind of have to go vertical integration for the downstream, mm -hmm. but how to do it in such a way so that the corporate bureaucracy that we have doesn't kill the vitality mm -hmm. and the fast speed reaction of the Chinese target company. Most likely it is fire a you know, joint venture where we could own the majority but we leave a big biscuit at the end so that if you hit these milestones and you have key criteria that doesn't impact on speed to customer, your net promoter score, then and as well as profitability, then this is what you can get cash out at the very end. Mm -hmm. And that we do in such a way where the integration of it 
we just do maybe commercial integration, but when it comes to the operational side, we leave that totally independent with the exception of satisfying environmental health and safety requirements, which is the um, same across any, organ every, any geography we operate. Well, in the beginning, uh, we, we had mentioned uh, that the audience likes to hear tips and recommendations. So we're coming to a close. I'd like for uh, each of you just to give one, as we're, as we're looking forward for this space of, this bigger space of M&A, one, one tip or one recommendation or one thought or advice to the audience. Teo, would you like to start? I know they put you on the spot, but what is one thing? No, no. The, uh, the tip is to see the opportunity right now in this uh, changing marketplace and really act fast on it. Uh, otherwise, you miss opportunity and we're going towards another trend or another, another cycle whatsoever. See the cycle right now, see the opportunity right now, and uh, act fast. Because at the end of the day, especially in Amon Day, there is not a kind of right or wrong. Mm. Uh, over, the, over the time, you could also say uh, you have a kind of a, a fashion movement in Amon Day, you know? 40 years ago, you had a lot of companies that have been very widely diversified conglomerates, uh, was taught in academia. Everybody read the book 40 years ago in search of excellence and so on. And then we came back, no, no, we can't do that. Focus on your core competence, vertical integration and so on. Uh, we're right now uh, after COVID-19, which shows a, a kind of a new risk profile. People said, mm, we're only in one marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. We've short term cash. It would have been better uh, to be in another industry, but a lot of boards and a lot of shareholders, they're not ready yet to, to, to think out of the box. I mean, if you would approach the board of director in ABB, the company you just mentioned, we now have to invest in heavily in agriculture in Africa. They said, whoa, 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 we can't okay. do that. It's impossible. Okay, thank you. Think so, out of the box, looking for new opportunities. And now, think fast, act fast. Yes. Okay. Bernhard, your one key um, advice. I would say never underestimate the power of storytelling. It's almost like it where you talk to the founder, your team, as well as headquarters, and think of yourself as a chief storytelling officer. I mean, the reason why I say that is that <laughs> when people have a level of fear, then those really works. And even when you talk about super high valuations, what we realize is that when we were able to tell the story about why we're the best partner and make it from a logical executions perspective, we were actually able to get a valuation post a 20 times revenue that a financial investor invested in. Mm -hmm. We were able to invest a five times revenue because they realized without support, you can actually have a very clear logical way to even de-risk and accelerate growth. And I think if it wasn't for that storytelling, uh, we most likely would have uh, either not invested or if we were able to get approval, paid 20 times revenue. So the 25% versus, I mean, it's a massive difference. For a very highly sought after investment where Hill House Capital is have the story, have the yeah. story and know how to tell yeah. it. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Professor Lee. <laughs> I've had several different thoughts, but after hearing that, <laughs> I want to say you got to first act fast <laughs> and then get your story right. And then um, <laughs> and then probably I, I tell them to be open minded about things, because a lot of value comes from really unexpected and surprising places in an m &A, um, research shows that whatever you plan for may not be what you get. And so be open minded about what opportunities might be there. And um, yeah. That could be. <laughs> and my final one would be very, be decisive with the leadership and communicate it immediately. Don't wait. It's, it's, the, it's the thing that kills things, I think, the most mm -hmm. is when the firm doesn't know where it's going or who the people are going to be running it are. Um, do that quickly, swiftly, and communicate it deeply with the story, et cetera, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. So we've got a bunch of other questions. We could st spend another hour, I guess, answering questions. But what, what we're going to do is, and this is what we tend to do, is we send uh, the speakers the questions. And if, if you could answer some of those, two or three in, in a couple sentences on some of these questions, we send that back as well as the slides that, uh, that you showed, Professor uh, Lee. Uh, we share that with uh, the, the audience and uh, so to, to keep them in the loop. And thank you all very much. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for the dialogue. It goes so fast this hour. Uh, wish you all a great day, a great evening, and look forward to seeing you in our, one of our next webinars in June or July. Thank <laughs> you.